Uh, my name is Michael Case. I work with QR Consulting. We are um, a smallish company, about 12 people. Some of us are in California, but we're in five time zones um, distributed about. We work on a variety of different projects, ranging from um, small embedded type systems to you know, larger thousands of cores in the cloud doing stuff with terabytes of data transferred a day. So we have um, a variety of different things that we do and scale. Um, we mostly like working on interesting projects. That's, uh, that's kind of how that works out. So um, the filter is, do we look like we're going to have fun? And if so, let's do that. Um, all right, so part one of this talk is uh, we can't have nice things. So the reason we can't have nice things are usually these three reasons. Uh, at least these are the three that I hear. One, things are too slow, or they're too bloated, or they're just way too strange. And this is coming from an embedded point of view where most of the people that you work with are using C. It's okay, Odin. Sorry. <laughs> and so um, if you're coming from C, you have a perspective. Uh, you have a perspective of how the language is going to work. You have a perspective of what C++ looks like. And your perspective often lies on, uh, on these three things as far as what you're going to do with the language and how you're going to get it to work. And uh, so let's start off by talking about these, why we can't have nice things. Um, oh, talking about not having nice things, did you see that really cool transition? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How many of you have Macs that now do this? Yeah, thank you, Apple. Okay. PDF renderer now has blurring fade effect. <laughs> so yeah, you can write, um, you can write slow performing code in, in any language, right? Yeah, that's, that's easy to do. Um, and so we probably have all experienced that. that. That's not a language issue all the time. And in fact, just for emphasis, we, don't, we could pick any language and do this. If you use a language incorrectly or you use the incorrect idioms, you're going to end up with something that's slow. That's, that's kind of the way it's going to happen. Typically, in the embedded world, what we end up seeing are um, a variety of different things. The first two, um, optimizations are turned off. And the reason is because it maps more easily to the generated assembly or it's easier to step through your code. And as a result, um, this O0 will be the common setting you'll see inside of um, a large number of embedded type projects because the manual says for O0, reduce compilation time, when, and make debugging produce the expected results. I mean, who doesn't want debugging to produce expected results, right? Okay, so you, know, you can kind of see why you want O0. It's the, it's the default and um, that's what you'll find on most. This last one, though, fixes strange problems. Um, I mean, I just a couple weeks ago ran into this as we're talking to somebody, and they had delivered a library that's being integrated in a project that we're working on. Um, it's a CAN, CAN bus library, and it's in C. And um, I said, hey, so there are no optimizations turned on. Oh, yeah, we turn optimizations on, and it doesn't work. <laughs> All right, so uh, typically, this is an indicator that you have something wrong. So the types of things that you often have wrong are somewhere you have messed up volatile, somewhere you have messed up your interrupt routine handling, or somewhere you've messed up the lack of memory barriers that you should need. Uh, all of these subjects have been discussed either by myself or Odin, hi Odin, um, at one time or another. So go ahead and find a video and look them up. Or if you're not sure, ask me later or ask Odin. He loves to talk about this stuff too. And, um, and, and we can talk a little bit more about it. But, if optimizations are causing you trouble, you are masking a problem in your code. There is a real problem that you have, and you're just masking it. So if you can't run with optimizations, evaluate what's going on. This is the other thing. Modern techniques depend upon optimizations being turned on. If you don't turn optimizations on, you end up with bloat. Usually you throw stuff at me first, but okay, yes. Well, I got your attention quickly. Yeah, that worked, I know. <laughs> Um, on the previous slide, I would add the, the other bullet, which is um, undefined behavior. You have undefined behavior in your code, and when you turn optimizations on, the behavior changes. Yeah, great comment. Uh, Marshall reminds us that undefined behavior, as we change our optimization settings, we're going to change the behavior of the undefined behavior, potentially. Um, and so that's also a problem, which is why we should just all program and const expert. <laughs> right. 
And then it wouldn't be a problem at all. Yeah, all right. Const expert ASM blocks. Yeah. Const expert ASM blocks, there we go. We won't need hardware soon enough because nothing will need to run on it later. Um, okay, bloated, yes. Uh, you can write bloated code. That, that's easy to do. Um, but you know what? The idea and the concept of bloated, often I will kind of write that off as like you're just using it wrong or you're doing something that you shouldn't. But the reality is, is that sometimes C++ code is bloated. It just is. And um, we're going to take a look at a little bit of that. So first of all, RTTI. Um, so how many people in this room, in a project that is shipped somewhere, have ever used RTTI? Oh, wow. <laughs> what did you think I was going to say? <laughs> I'm impressed or, or shocked or like now RTTI, like the compiler supplied RTTI? Yeah. OK, wow. OK, I don't like RTTI <laughs> at all. <laughs> so what's that? Marshall's one doesn't count because he doesn't use the C++. Yeah, OK, OK. <laughs> so the problem with it, um, or one of the problems with RTTI, is that it just kind of, it violates this rule we have in C++, which is you don't pay for what you don't use. And uh, I don't use it, and I'm paying for it a lot. Uh, now, hopefully, you have a good link time optimization that gets rid of it, but if you don't, uh, you're gonna be paying for this. Exceptions, I don't wanna have an exception debate right now, but exceptions, a lot of times in embedded, are not used. Um, they're just not. And so, the first step is just do this, turn them off. Just turn them off. So you've got compiler switches for that. The other is uh, compile and link time optimizations are often turned off in, in projects. And so you end up with bloat because you just aren't using the tool the way that the tool wants to be used. And so uh, use dash OS um, as a minimum and uh, LTO switches. LTO requires both switches at the compile time and at the link time. And uh, you can get some pretty nice results. You can also find some very interesting latent bugs, of which Odin will talk to you about later. He's done lightning jumps on. I'm just going to keep throwing people at you, Odin. <laughs> OK, the other reason you sometimes end up with um, bloated code is because uh, almost like a misunderstanding of templates. Templates, you can kind of think about them two different ways. Or at least I think about them two different ways. One way I think about templates is it's a code generator, right? I give it stuff, and it just like it stamps out new things with new types or new values, and it does, does stuff for me. The other way to think about it is it's a pattern matching thing. And the pattern matching thing allows me now to um, do template metaprogramming and other types of things. Now, understanding your templates and how they're going to be used, you might actually save yourself code simply by using them properly. Or understanding the fact that uh, you just generated five functions for something you didn't really need five functions for. Or maybe you were going to generate five unique functions by hand. How many have seen code where it's like foo underscore i for the int version and foo underscore f for the floating point version? Right. Yeah, so in those cases, template engine's really great. It does what you need it to, because you're already going to generate multiple versions. Um, Object-oriented bloat. C++ is a wonderful language, and it supports all kinds of different programming idioms. Uh, Object-oriented is an idiom. So there's some smiles. It, it's one. There are lots of idioms, and it's not necessarily the right idiom all the time. Um, in fact, probably seldom. And um, find the right idiom that matches actually the problem that you're solving. And it might be different idioms at different times in the same project. All right, here's a raw loop um, on the, your left-hand side here. Uh, it's just going to go ahead and count how many eights we have, and it will let us know how many eights we have. All right? Pardon me? It's bloated. It's bloated. OK. So uh, the, the other thing is a dot size. Um, you know, I hate YouTube comments. I'm just going to make, make this comment so that somebody can actually tell me why they hate my video this time, too. <laughs> Last year, this guy knows nothing about embedded systems because main doesn't take an argv RC. Look, the whole idea was just so that, you know, the compiler explored and optimized the whole thing away. So this time, it's an extern thing sitting somewhere. So it's just A. All right, so we've got this on the left. And we don't like that because it's raw loops. But on the right, 
we've got a standard algorithm, because we have a perfectly good algorithm that will count the number of occurrences of something that have occurred. All right. Now, I like this a lot more than I like that. OK? No comments from the back. <laughs> they basically produce the same code. So basically, from a bloat point of view, I don't have all of the template bloated spew that people talk about. It just isn't there. It might have been there long ago, but it isn't there today. And that's part of the battle that we have. All right. Uh, now, on the left-hand side, we have this um, fur filter. And we're going to calculate it for four points. We know the four points. We're just going to go ahead and multiply by the coefficients, add the result, return it. Um, what is this called as far as a algorithm? OK, so we could use inner product, because that seems like that would work very nicely. But we do end up with bloat with inner product. So the idea that bloat doesn't exist, we like to talk about. But the reality is we're not all the way there. And this is why instrumentation is so important in understanding. Also, I might not care. Because typically, speed is not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about size. Most often, I'm concerned about size. Usually, it's fast enough. <clears throat> All right. So too strange. Too strange, too complex, uh, too foreign. I get this a lot. Um, so you know what? This is actually, this is actually true. Um, we can write very complex looking stuff. If this is your first time at this conference, by the end of the week, you will see some very complex stuff, I suspect, because this is where I learned all of my complex stuff. Um, so it is possible that we end up writing code that is foreign and strange and complex. Uh, that, that should not be what we're aiming for. Um, but nobody understands. I hear this a lot. Now, Nobody understands because we kind of have this problem where um, we're, not, we're not teaching it or some, some other things going on. We're coming from a C world into a C++ world. And so I actually heard this comment two weeks ago from somebody on a project. Um, doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the project is significantly less complex after some changes that have been made to the hardware. However, that does not mean I want to use C now. So my first response, you know, internally was, no. <laughs> and uh, my coworker's feedback was that I, I maintained my composure, so I, I'm glad. Um, but, you know, there are, there are some concerns about that. And we need to figure out ways to actually make things less complex. They're not as complex as people think. So this whole idea of no language below, except for C and assembly, you know, that's the problem, is that you bootstrap everything with assembly or C, and then the next thing you know, then you're into C++. And that took a lot of work to get that far. And so why not you just stay in C? Because you're, you're like, you feel like you're almost done with the project by this point. Uh, so John gave a talk called, This is Why We Can't Have Nice Things. And whether you believe in uh, the East Coast or the West Coast, East Const or Const West, doesn't really matter. But the point that he made on this one slide is that even the core guidelines recognize that one makes more sense, but all of the old things that we have written down have it the other way. And we don't want to confuse people. So maybe we need to work on that. Um, OK, so why? We want higher abstraction without overhead. We want the type system because it adds safety. Um, we want to allow a more declarative style, and we want to support composition. So these are the reasons that we end up using C++ in small projects. Uh, declarative thinking. So let's think a little bit about declarative thinking. What is it? Well, you know, at the, at the base level, it's we want to describe what to do instead of how to do it. That's what we're trying to aim for. And um, the, the reason we want to do that is the value is in the what. What we all get paid for, in essence, by somebody is value. 
And value is added by the what. It's not necessarily added by the how. There are exceptions to that, but generally speaking, value comes from the things that we're going to push up. And we want to push the other things down. Ben gave a great talk last year. He gave it twice. It was so good. Um, but you want to watch the 90-minute version instead. So watch, uh, watch that on de declarative. So uh, we have a, um, a project that we did a couple years ago now where it had two MCUs. And uh, one of them was the main MCU. It was handling the vision processing and, and some other things for this project. And the other was handling all the motor control systems. And we got pulled onto the project because uh, the vision was slow and the motor control wasn't keeping up. So they had serious speed issues. And uh, as we sat down, one of the problems was just getting messaging moving fast enough back and forth. It has a spy. Um, spy are used for everything from your SD cards to all kinds of things talk with spy. It has this idea of master out, slave in, master in, slave out, and a clock, one clock. So as it's being clocked, it's a synchronous thing that's driven through the system and back through. Um, this is what we ran into. This is the messaging system that was set up. It was written in C. And um, it has a lot of what's and how's kind of mixed in here together. It ends up that uh, some things are important, like this thing that's been given a new name called thing, and this other one called mode, both of which are ints, and you shouldn't swap them. I know from personal experience, because bad things happen to the motor when you do that. So uh, here is a perfect example of where type safety saves you, right? If we used different types, we would be better off. So the first thing we did is our thing actually has an ID. It has a left and a right and an other. And our set thing then has the thing ID, and it actually has a value associated with it. We're using types in order to describe the messages. And those messages then um, have to do with the what, not the hows. Um, now, there has to be a little bit of magic somewhere to make all this work, and uh, if you're used to using or have used before Fusion out of Boost, they have this idea of adaption. Uh, we have our own adaption. Um, but the idea is that you're going to give it a struct, and you're going to list the members that you're interested in of that struct in the order that you're interested in of them. And it's going to adapt, in essence, what works out to be like a reference, a tuple of references to those members so that you can keep it in, you can move it in and out. So this is magic, but it's not purely magic because it also describes the ordering and what I'm interested in of, of importance. Um, and so when we want to go ahead and send a message, we simply say, uh, send the message and the message will go ahead and send uh, using a type. So we're back in the type system, things are safe. This is, this is nice and kind of like where we want to stay. Um, of course, you can, you can just write it all just like that, too. So we had in the C, it was um, just over 3,000 lines of code. When we got done with the other version, uh, it was just over 1,000 lines of code. And I don't know what the generated looked like. But what I do know is it was significantly faster, and it fit on the device. And that's actually all I cared about. So it fit those two things for us. So here's the idea. We're trying to shove more things up into the what and keep very few things into the hows. Like, how do we actually serialize those? And only have to mention how to do that one time. OK, so the question now is, why, though, why embedded domain-specific languages? Why go there? Why not just use all the other tools that you have? Um, okay, so it ends up that too many programmers tweeted with my name mentioned out of the blue random, like I didn't have a conversation going on about anything, um, that why does the grammar description, why is it baked into the source code? It makes it inflexible, requires recompilation every time the grammar changes. Um, that is true. It, it, is baked into the source code because it's the embedded domain-specific language. And I suspect this is talking about a spirit something or another. It just happens that it came just a couple weeks ago on April 24th, which is my birthday, which means you could ignore any tweets that you want. And I ignored this one. 
So I didn't have to reply. Um, but it's a good question. Like, like, why have something embedded? What's the point of doing that? How many use some type of an embedded domain-specific language now? So about half the room currently uses at least one. There are lots of reasons. Uh, one is that there's only a single stage that you have to worry about building. You don't have like Lex and Yak and something else or whatever running that's then generating code and then bringing in. But easily integrates because it's already C++. I mean, it doesn't look like C++, but that's the whole idea is that it doesn't look like C++. It looks like some embedded domain language, but it's just C++. And so as a result, it embeds nicely already with whatever thing you're trying to do. Uh, you still have this recompile change thing, no matter if you're using a, an external generator or not, right? If you change the grammar, you change the grammar. Uh, there are lots of talks about how to help uh, speed up compilation and isolate yourselves from those changes, uh, many of which I have talked about with Spirit. So if you want those techniques, go look at those. Um, runtime, if you do runtime loading of the language, you still have a domain-specific language you have to deal with. You still have an engine of some sort that you have to use to grovel over it. Um, and then the final one, which is really kind of what drives me most, is exposing more to the compiler produces better results. The more I can tell the compiler about something without getting in its way, the better results the compiler will produce. And I want this idea of um, declarative, and I want to be able to compose things together. All right, so uh, how many of you have switch statements in some piece of code that is a state machine? Like a gnarly, like it should be a state machine. It is a state machine, it's not just like a switch. Yeah, everybody. So why do we do this to ourselves? It's horrible. Like stop, don't do that anymore, ever. Now this is from um, an MQTT, a portion of an MQTT client uh, that is the state table for one of the machines. There are a couple different machines that, that keep the client running. And uh, it tells me the what part right away. It is in a transition table because I like to deal with state machines in transition tables. It has the, um, the start over here. So this is the starting state and some event that's going to occur. What state am I going to move to? What action am I going to take when it occurs? And are there any guards? Clearly, I don't care about guards. There are no guards. So for this state machine, none. This is actually one level of a state machine. It's hierarchical. Uh, it ends up that this connect broker is actually another substate that has its own table. And so we could build state machines in ways that we want to deal with them and can understand them. This happens to be um, MSM, Boost MSM. And uh, we'll talk about another one here in a little bit. But this is so much nicer to deal with than a switch statement. This is going to be easier. So at what cost would you trade doing this instead of the switch statement? Like how much are you willing to pay? Let's say, let's say it costs twice as much in size over the switch statement. N of course not. We're all C++ compiled. OK, maybe, maybe Odin's, maybe. I, I might even pay twice. Yeah. As long as it's not RAM, we're good. Um, how about maybe if it's only 20% more? 20%? You, boy, you, this is a hard crowd. Not, not gonna, it's gotta be the same as the switch statement or else I'm not gonna do it. Wow, okay, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of embedded domain specific language is that they, they allow us to think in terms of the domain itself. And good ones allow us to think at that higher level without actually imposing a cost. I don't wanna pay for it, just like you. I mean, nobody, especially at this conference, nobody's gonna raise their hand. Except for Odin. Because <laughs> Odin has debugged enough state machines written in switch statements <laughs> that he knows he never wants to do that again. Um, okay, so let's talk about state machines. So we already talked about, or we saw a little portion of Boost MSM. We use Boost MSM, or used to use it quite a bit, but as the language has evolved, so have the techniques and the capabilities of the language and what we're allowed to do. And um, now we have things like SML, which is not a Boost library yet. That has been up there as long as Boost Stash has been around, at least. So we got to work on that, huh? So um, 
Boost SML is the state machine language slash light slash library. Huh? If you're not sure what to name it, just come up with a good last <coughs> one there. And um, it's a domain specific language for hierarchical state machines. Chris Juziak wrote it. He will be talking about it tomorrow. So go to his talk. You're all here, so you're not listening to him talk right now about um, dependency, dependency injection. injection. But uh, SML has dependency injection, which is very cool inside of SML. Uh, I think he should have actually named it Boost SML Cubed, but whatever. <laughs> all right, so here's the idea. Uh, hierarchical state machines look something like this, or this is not hierarchical, but this is a state machine. And the state machine in UML syntax, we've got different states. And as we transition from uh, one state to the next, this tells us what the event is going to be. This tells us what the action will be. Um, we could also have an event that has a guard, and then we actually have an action. Um, this is the event, there is no action associated with it. And so we, there's a way to write these inside of UML. It already exists. Now, if we look at this and we look at the thing below, there's a lot of similarities. Here is the start state, connect slash establish. Oh, here's the event and here's the action and this is the destination state. Here we have our ping and this is the guard and here's the action. The syntax looks very, very similar. And so if you're used to UML, it's easy to come to something like this and just be able to read the table and know what it is. This is the idea of, of the EDSL, right? Is that we can actually just write what we want and not have to write this as a switch statement. I mean, even this simple thing as a switch is gonna be horrible. It's just gonna be horrible. Now, how much are you willing to pay for this? Negative 10%. Nothing, still nothing. Yeah, nothing because uh, I know it. Oh, okay, well, you've seen the last slide, so that's not any fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so SML um, uses the same amount as the switch. So the, you're not gonna pay anything for it. This is a wonderful domain specific language, right? It allows us to actually talk and speak at a higher level, at higher level abstractions without paying for that. Um, okay, you can find it inside this spot. Talk to Chris while he's here. Let's talk a little bit about protocols. Spirit is one that we use. Um, we don't use it in bare metal. Um, Joel, Hartmut, and Dan were the, uh, the main contributors. Um, and it is for parsing and generating. Uh, anybody have code that looks like this for parsing? Yeah, good. It's interesting, the same people who do RTTI. Okay. <laughs> So uh, it's a peg thing. Peg is a parsing expression grammar. And up here is, not really, but pr let's pretend for a moment, this is what emails look like. We have a description for a name. So it's, it's gonna have one or more characters, A through Z, followed by a optional or zero to, sorry, zero to N dot, followed by one or more characters, A through Z. Um, host has something similar, but it's gonna have this alternative at the end where it's either com org or a net. And then an email address is a name with an at symbol and then a host. We can see that there's a very similar correlation with the, um, with the spirit grammar down below. Uh, because of things like we need to use the unary plus, so it's gotta be on the front, and same for, um, oops, other things. Okay, moving on, because we're gonna run out of time. Uh, <laughs> CTRE, so compile time regular expressions. Um, so, this is cool. This is 20, C++ 20. Um, this match is occurring right here. Looking for a date. So if you can read a regular expression, which I hear we all can do, um, this will then do this match. And um, it's going to go ahead and put the results inside of whole year, month, and day. Whole being it was an entire match. And if it is an entire match, then um, returning the um, a date type. And this is actually returning um, string views to the actual locations in the, the thing that got passed in that's being searched. Now, this is kind of cool. We don't do a lot of text processing. Most of the things we do are protocol type things that are moving on buses. Um, and Spirit also does binary type protocol stuff, so that works fine for us. But then, Hannah had this tweet 
and it had like a series of things inside Slack. It was very cool because it also works with uh, non-text things. So we haven't started using this on a project um, that's shipping yet, but we're using it on an internal project to try to understand it, where we use regular expressions in order to basically act as a lexer. Um, okay. So how do we make an EDSL? So it may, it may require unicorns. It's possible. Um, it also might actually just be dragons instead of unicorns. Um, it could be some combination of a dragon and a unicorn, but Odin, I'm pretty certain it will not be cute and cuddly at all. So at this point, I'm supposed to read this warning from our lawyers. Warning, the following sections are about writing libraries to give us the declarative and compositional powers of an embedded domain-specific language. This code may seem complex, though it will compile down to nothing, we assure you. It might cause you to not want to enter the world of C++ or ever use it again. Your eyes may turn red. If you are exhibiting symptoms, please discontinue the video and simply use the EDSLs available to you. Feel free to even request new libraries. If you want one, please email Odin. <laughs> I was supposed to take a picture too, but that's okay. All right, so, <laughs> so a common thing that we have to deal with are filters and filter type structures. Um, so here is a, is a finite input, impulse response filter where something comes in and it's delayed, um, it's delayed a certain amount of time and um, down here our Bs are usually constants. We're multiplying the value that came in and summing up the results. Uh, the delays in this, this notation of Z is from Z transforms, which are like the discrete version of Laplace. Um, and so we use terms like Z to the negative one to mean it's been delayed by one clock or one, one bit in time. Um, we might have to deal with PID controllers. And um, a PID controller has some type of a structure also in which data is going to flow and be divided out. Um, PID coming from the three main portions of it, of proportional, integral, and differential portions of this controller. Uh, lots of things that we deal with have a structure that kind of look like this. But when we write the code, we don't really end up with writing code. Sometimes it looks so nice and pretty and understanding where the structure is. But it would be nice if the code kind of mimicked that structure at least better than it does today. One thing that you can see that occurs um, pretty regularly here is that we have data and that data then is going to flow into another block, right? And then the next block is going to do something with that data. And uh, that's going to continue on. Uh, this, unfortunately, looks horrible, though, because G, if I wanted to think about this if, from functions, I could pass G to foo, and the result of foo gets passed into bar, and then the result of bar goes into gorp, right? This is kind of like the backwards thing of what we want to think about for this problem. So. Um, here we go, we've got our G. We would like to maybe use pipes or something else to think about things moving from left to right. And um, G and our foo, and then that result moves into bar, and that result moves into gorp. Now, if we're writing our own EDSL, we can do anything we want. We can pick anything, any way that we want to do this, right? And uh, I like pipe. There are reasons not to like pipe, but at the moment I'm going to like pipe because anybody familiar with any Unixy type thing is familiar with pipe, and uh, pipes will just work. So, <clears throat> how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, I'm going to suggest that instead of uh, this for passing our G in, our some value that we have that we're going to start off with, um, that we pass in this thing called in, and um, it's going to represent whatever an input value is. And now I've generated a callable that I can call later with G. So I've composed this thing such that I now have an F, which will result in taking the past in result, calling foo, taking that result, calling var, calling, taking that result, calling door. Uh, so what do we need to make this work? What's our first item? In, in yeah, we probably should do whatever that in thing is. Okay. Uh, so in is just identity, right? It's just whatever I pass in, if I call a function, I need to pass that back out. And we want to make everything objects, 
so that we can actually start composing these at some point and keeping track and hold of them. So we're going to create one called identity. Anything that I pass in, I'm just going to return that as a result. OK. So um, here I passed in 8, and um, I got 8 back, which was an integer, and 7.5, and I have a floating point version back, right? So 7.5. Um, th so this is going to do what I need. Uh, now what do I need? What's the next thing I'm going to need in this process? Pipes. pipes. OK, so I should probably end up with some pipes. Uh, so the concept here is I want to look at that pipe, and I want to create a type that's going to represent that. And what is that going to do? Well, it's going to have a right-hand side and a left-hand side. And right-hand side needs to be called with whatever the left-hand side evaluated to. And then we're going to do that again. But this next pipe is going to simply be um, the previous pipe is its left-hand side, and a value now is, or whatever bar is, is going to be the right-hand side. And then again. And we're going to keep building up this type structure so that as we build up our types, the final type represents the expansion of the whole thing. So pipe could look like this, where I have a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and I'm going to just go ahead and store those off, left-hand side and right-hand side. And when I call it with some number of parameters, I need to call the left-hand side, and whatever it results, then I'm going to call the right-hand side. And what is call right-hand side? Um, call right-hand side is going to go ahead and take whatever the results were and pass them off to uh, calling the right-hand side. Um, OK. so. So that's our pipe. And now how are we going to get a pipe type? Um, we'll have to overload our operator. So we'll go ahead and take operator. And let's just take everything in the whole world. That sounds like that should work. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and create a pipe. All right. So there's some laughing about taking everything in the whole world. Uh, there's been some slideware. The back row is giggling. It's OK. But at this point, what, what it, we can see is we could actually think about this problem and figure out, what, is the left-hand side and the right-hand side going to meet some type of attribute that I care about? We could figure that out. We could figure out that in the pipe, that the result of the left-hand side, whatever that type is, is compatible with calling something on the right-hand side. Right? We, can, we could do that. So the, the right-hand side, excuse me, could, could use that as an input. We, we could do that. We can, in fact, we can put all kinds of different constraints so that by the end of the composition, by the end of composing these different types, we've made some good determinations that it's been composed and put together properly. One of the advantages, actually, of the DSL is to make sure the thing is correct. When we attach state machines, distributed state machines, we make sure that the ports can actually send messaging back and forth that's compatible. That one machine won't end up with some message that it never expected. Because we check that at compile time. There's all kinds of things you can do at compile time to make sure that you are actually composing a system that makes sense. We didn't do any of it. And that's OK for right now. All right, words you will never hear at this conference, and I'm going to say them, the wonders of ADL. And I mean it in a positive way. <laughs> All right, so yes, friends, <laughs> or at least late night buddies, right? <laughs> so uh, in order to get some of this to work, we are going to actually need to um, put everything into a namespace. And the reason we do this is for argument-dependent lookup. I, I kind of want this operator to be discovered when things that are in the namespace with that operator are one of its arguments. That will help make my life easier. And so sometimes we call this tainting it. We're going to taint the operator. Um, in this particular instance, we're going to use identity. Identity is tainted because it's in that namespace of filter. And so uh, this is going to actually be the operator bar that I'm looking for. 
All right, this will actually produce something for us. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got the calls. On the right-hand side, we've got this other thing that we've set up. Now, what is this going to produce? What is the code generation going to look like? Because it looks like we went through a whole lot of work just so that we could write pipes, right? Are there going to be a quadratic number of copies? Or the type of quadratic number of copies, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? <laughs> Pardon? I did not forward properly everywhere. And yes, and so that's the type of thing you may want to think about doing. Pardon me? There is some trouble. So, um, as is, without all of the forwarding magic, and your compiler had a decent optimization, it's just going to do the right thing. They're going to produce actually the exact same result. Now, there might be a little confusion of what result it produced because um, Foo, Bar, and Gorp aren't really actually being used. So uh, let's just go ahead and stick those inside of an anonymous namespace right now so that we don't need them for external linkage. And yeah, sure enough, everything got inline. We can just see it better now. This is all it produced. So all of that ugliness behind the scene disclaimer thing, that exists so that we can actually, we write libraries so that we can make nice, pretty code, right? So that we can actually deal with the domain higher up so that we can move ourselves up into this declarative thing, worry about value. I can write filters much faster and reason about them much faster if I can do that at a higher level than if I have to keep looking at the low level and understanding, what's this function doing again? And what are these variables? Um, and if I don't have to pay anything for it, I'm much happier. But you actually can have nice things. You can have nice things. Yes, thank you. Uh, OK, so let's const expert all the things, literally, and uh, see what happens. So now, if we just const expert all the things and we pass in something that it knows about instead of this extern thing that was out there in the middle of nowhere, um, hey, look, it just calculated a value that it knew. So that same technique, the compiler can just see through. And you can end up with all the same value, uh, benefits. Was it necessary? No, it was only necessary to const expert the things you needed to have const expert. <laughs> yeah, would at that moment the same effect? I would, I would have also optimized to this without const expert. If you put the right consts in the right spots, you probably would have gotten the same response. Yes. Yeah. But what you could not have done, and uh, let me point this out, is this. I have a standard array float, and how many parameters does it have? It's based upon calling my filter that I created here and getting that result and sticking it in, right? So this is the size of this array, which is a uh, non-type template parameter. It is a compile time thing, right? And so I'm able to actually then use it inside of, inside of um, constant expressions, which is the whole idea. You know, I thought I needed to too, but it didn't require. Okay. <laughs> what I really said. <laughs> I'm using what I did here, actually. Ah. I don't know. I'll I'll check in afterwards. OK, so coming back and looking at this, um, what other things do we need? Well, we need constants. Those are some of the other things that we're going to need. And uh, how do we make a constant? Well, constants are easy. I'll go ahead and generate my constant. I'll create this thing and store it off. And I don't really care what you pass in as the argument when you call this. I'm always going to give you back whatever the constant value is. So now I have a way to make constants, except that um, writing this, kind of is ugly. Filter, constant, blah. Um, so there's got to be a better way to do that. What was the suggestion? UDL. OK, so let's do some UDL. Um, and because I'm actually a double E, I like K for my constants. Oh, yeah, cheering me on. 
<laughs> so we're going to have k as ours. And so how UDLs work is now I can have this long, long version, and I can have an unsigned long, long, um, sorry, long double, or an unsigned long, long. And I'm going to go ahead and create a constant and return that. So I can change my code now to look like this, 42.3 underscore capital K, that now is my constant. Now it's starting to look kind of nice. I can have constants with underscore K to do what I want. Most of the time, to be honest, um, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with floats anyhow, so floats are fine. This will work for other types too, but floats are gonna be okay. Um, okay, that took care of our constants. Uh, what else might we need? How about these delays? Let's figure out how in the world we're gonna produce a delay. Um, so if I have my n, and here I'm going to just take whatever came in, multiply it by two, return it, and then printer is gonna just take whatever it gets for the arguments, print those out to the standard out inside of square brackets, and then whenever it gets the next call, it'll put on the next line. So as we call through this with one, two, three, four, and five, we're going to print out two, four, six, eight, and 10. All right, so far so good. Now, if we put a delay in here, we would expect it to print out instead, um, everything delayed by one. And who knows what that first value is? Whatever we maybe initialize it is. We say what its initial state is. All right, so there are all kinds of ways that we could actually write delay. Um, and here's one stab at it. For delay, we're going to go ahead and say that um, whatever, whatever the type is, is gonna be the type that's stored internally for delaying. And um, this value here is going to represent the delay. So a one would be delay by one amount. Um, and uh, what I would want to do is now somehow deal with delaying everything by one clock cycle, all right? So, um, there's a trade-off that can be made. I can do this actually with one variable if I have a temporary storage. So I'd have to make an additional copy along the way, which we'll see in a moment. Um, but I'm not gonna do it that way. I'm going to eat up one more space than I need for all of my delay circuits. So my array is going to store two elements. I'm gonna set the head and the tail to zero and I'm um, gonna create one of these. So our delay, we can either just go ahead and um, brace initialize these things with whatever the t-type is, or we can pass in a value that we would like them to be filled with. Is there any special, anything special in that this delay z is of signed type as opposed to unsigned type? Uh, yes. Is there, is there anything special about it being signed versus unsigned? There is. We'll get there. Um, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Now, what's the callable operator for this look like? So the callable operator for this is I want to take the value that's coming in and I want to shove it into the back. And whatever the delayed version is, is the one that I need to return, right? So I can simply go ahead and shove it in wherever the, the head is pointing and I can go ahead and increment the tail and then return that, whatever the tail is pointing at. And so if you think about this, if I have a delay of, um, of two, well, a delay of one, so I've got two things, delay of one, I've got two things inside of here. They've both been initialized here. As one's coming in, I point here, the one that I'm returning, I first increment and I return that. And the next time around, I'm gonna actually then return the first one. And so however size my, my array is, that minus one is my delay length. And so I'm, I'm always just returning either the filled initial version or my delayed, my delayed amount. All right, so now we have a delay. And um, I can stick that in there. And now we delay the result. Now again, this looks ugly. It would be nice if we could make it look better somehow. 
I hear we can do this someday, maybe in 2022. But for now, we're going to do this. We're going to go ahead and um, have a method that has a template parameter. And um, we're going to call it Z, the, the method Z. And it's going to go ahead and delay by whatever the index is minus one, because I want the user to put in negative numbers. In fact, uh, I'm going to make sure they do. I'm going to check with a static assert. So I'm going to add a little bit of checking. Now, why do I want a negative number? Because um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a Z transform, and Z minus one means one delay. And I want somebody to put Z one in, because I don't know how to deal with future values that I haven't seen yet. So there we go. So static assert allows me to check some things and make sure that they're correct, that they're, they're what I'm expecting or wanting. Um, and now we can do this. All right, so this is not completely satisfactory. Well, it's OK, but um, I wish it looked nicer. But at least I know it's a, it looks like a delay to me. This is the part where somebody in the back says, you should have. What? Yeah, so despite me wanting to put the value of the UDL inside there, you can't do it because the value of the UDL is an argument to the, to the function. And, well, you can't object on this standard. You can object on but the... But you have the version of UDL operators, the raw one, too, where you can actually do the number passing yourself and have that as template arguments. They have to be letters that could be in a hex number, but that does work. That's what I've done that. I keep getting talk on that. <laughs> okay. You just get letters till F, but uh, yeah. Okay. Look how the underscore these things. Two things are going in and out. Have a minus operator on. Yeah, I think the two problems are minus. Is this really just that? It's fine. You like it? I like it. No, no. This is the things that we worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's way better than you know, function composition. Okay. <laughs> So that the minus one is in the round bracket instead. Um, no. You pass the minus one as an integral constant to the function. And then you have the inside function. Yeah. Which everything is like that. Pass the minus one as a an integral constant. The Z function, you don't have to do the angle brackets anymore. So we put it in the wrong function. We unwrap the type inside the function and return that. Okay. Hmm. All right, there might be a solution. New <laughs> slide. <laughs> Too many things, yeah. So, yeah, so th what the problem is is that this is ugly still to me. So, um, Z. Well, I, I don't know at the moment. So, every time I dream up something, it doesn't work. <laughs> What's your name? David. David. David, I'm putting you on the commit. <laughs> but, but then you can't. Sorry, you still can't do it. Yeah, but what he just said is if you just use it from constant, you use it with the return type. Yeah, it's. But I also don't think it can work. I'm going to make this work tonight. <laughs> okay. Something on the Slack channel for later. Okay, what else are we missing? Definitely some, definitely feedback. 
Branching, yeah. Yeah, we also need a way to branch into um, different paths. So um, we'll just call it fork for now. C is a better word. I used fork last year, and people always convinced me that C is a better word. But because on, on, on a terminal, you also have a C, which forks. So I called mine split. No, it's, did you read command C? <laughs> yes, but. I don't, I don't have a single EE book that says T in it. <laughs> none, none that are ta talking about food. <laughs> Not one. T. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. I'll, maybe. So we can, yeah, we'll bike shed the name. Um, Why am I not concerned about what? The, the, the lambdas you have to write out. Yeah. It should be more like, like this constant, like, like in Haskell. Like oh, yeah. Just use boost lambda. So I totally lambda. agree. <laughs> so the question is, like do, like, do we even need this here? Right. The lambdas. What's the answer? Yes. Do we need them? No. No, we don't need, we don't need them. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you can make like a value type of like all the, all the operators. Yeah. Right, exactly. So we, we can take our value types. In fact, we could take things like our const and our identity, and we could start doing some things with them, right? We can, keep, we can add some things like operators on them. We can add operators into our space, maybe even better, inside of our filter namespace, operator plus, that goes ahead and creates a new type that evaluates the left-hand side and the right-hand side and then calls plus on them, right? That, that's kind of what we want. So, um, exactly. So we want to actually get eventually to this point of expression templates where we are using expressions to build up more types that will then be deduced. Um, Zach Lane is here this week and Zach has this thing called Boost Yap, which I've not used yet. It's for expression templates. And um, so somebody in here learn how to use it and then tell me in the bar later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how do we write fork? Yeah, that one. Okay, we're done. <laughs> so fork, um, the idea of fork is we want to take whatever the inputs are and we want to go ahead and call all the different arguments to fork. Each of the arguments to fork need to get called with whatever came in through the pipe, right? Okay. So, um, fork is going to go ahead and return a detailed fork impl using the expansion of t as its parameters and will forward the arguments. So it's going to construct one of these things. So what does fork impl look like? <coughs> All right, so um, in the in the private area, we're going to go ahead and store off a tuple of each of the nodes. So each of the types that got passed in, which are whatever these things are, we're just going to store a tuple of those. And when we create it, we'll go ahead and forward that off. So now we have forwarded those into those nodes, and we've got a tuple of that. When we now actually call the impl, the, the type itself, we're going to take it and we're going to call this for each fork, passing the nodes, and the expansion of whatever the call was in, that came in. So this part here is what came in from the pipe, right? Whatever the input is. All right, so what's for each fork? So for each fork, that's the tuple and dot dot tn. So I'm getting the tuple and I'm getting the arguments and I'm going to go ahead and calculate what is the size, I'm not gonna calculate the size, like Louis actually, thank you Louis, is calculating the size, or Marshall. <laughs> Marshall, thank you Marshall, um, of the tuple. And so now I know what, uh, how many elements are in the tuple and that tuple represents the things that I'm calling. 
And I'm going to go ahead and call for each fork impl, passing it the tuple, and this make index sequence, and then the arguments again. All right. So the point of this make index sequence is it's going to create a type such that whatever the n is, I'm going to get 0 to n minus 1 comma separated arguments. And those comma separated arguments are going to be useful because I'm going to use them on a moment inside of my impl. So in the impl, it's taking the tuple and it now has this thing called index sequence. Index sequence is what came from, from the previous thing. And um, indices is a pack, and it's a pack of size t type. And then these are the arguments still that I need to call. Now this allowed me then to get the indices. And I can now use these indices inside of an expansion um, and so here I'm going to use get and the first one will be zero and then one and then two and so forth. So I'm getting out of the tuple the function that I want to call and then I'm going ahead and expanding out the arguments. There are plenty of standard forwards that are missing, la da da, that don't fit on the slide, but um, comma and then dot 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 so that we can go ahead and expand it. Now this is a um, fold so that um, we have this fold expression that's going ahead and expanding it. I think this is a good way to say that because otherwise you might be double moving if I'm honest about it. If you try to add some forward in here, can we add... Oh yes, here, that's right. Because that could one call. But you have to worry that. And then you, you have like this dilemma of like which one should I call it? Correct, so yes. No, fine, it's fine, it's too small to say, okay, yeah, but yeah. if you give it a lambda, if you can yeah, capture yeah. your parent, this parent pack only exists for entry, right? The yeah. You don't need oh. it in the, in the in the in betweens because you can't return multiple things. You might be able to do it, yes. I can, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always one, like, you can return multiple things packed into something, but you can't return literally multiple things. And the, the mechanics look close enough to still apply that. Okay, so the mechanics look close enough, the question, or the comment is, the mechanics look close enough that apply could work. So uh, the dark little secret that I haven't told you is everything in this system uh, actually is able to return and take tuples of things because uh, you end up with these problems of all these paths may have actually multiple, you might not get one value back, you might get lots of values back. Right? And so multiple values back are represented as tuples of things. So while we've just been looking at so far the comma separated or the single version of something or the onesie or the call with a parameter thing, all of those, any of these t's anywhere along the line could actually end up being tuples. So, which is why it ends up not quite working. But apply works on, apply works for then expanding the tuple result. At the moment, they're being discarded in this slide. Yes. In this slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In this slide. in this slide, we are discarding, discarding them. Yeah. So okay. So here's a good question, right? So what what should we do? The plus fold expression of this bare structure here. Okay. Yep. A tuple of that out. Yep. Aren't you potentially moving the tuple multiple times? Also. Are you potentially moving the tuple multiple times? Yeah, so the thing you could do is std move of std get 
of Kubo, which is equivalent to saying stood that of stood forward. Yeah, okay, I get it. But stood moving the result of Kubo, I think, makes it clear that you're really yeah. in Kubo, you know you're yeah. moving out of it, but you're explicitly moving out of each element of the Kubo. Yeah. It's nifty. Louis for president. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, anyone else for president at this point, sorry. For the kids at home. Aren't you glad that? You it's a great talk. You just have to stand up here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am certain I've had too much allergy medicine because my Z is negative three, and I'm still trying to catch up. <laughs> All right, not important enough. There was a nit of some sort. Okay, is it wrong? No, it's correct. All right. <laughs> Oh, so we're going to care about returning the results because we can't just leave the result. Yeah, so we'll we'll eventually need to return the results. Okay, so um, no, I like the help. Um, okay, so so we get the results. Um, we could stick those in a tuple, return those back out. Let's. Let's now do the mental exercise, since I actually don't have the slide, I didn't figure we'd make it this far. Um, <laughs> the, what is the mental exercise of combining things back together again? So one thing is that you can either reduce or make or, 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 or you like apply? No, so you've got, um, let's, well, okay, so let's just pretend this is something else, maybe. Like, you don't know what it is. The opposite of split. Or T, or whatever you want to call it this week. Yes. Join, that will never fly. E-E-T, the opposite of T. E-E-T. And how, would, how should we deal with that? We're going to say everything returns the same types at the moment. Okay, and technically you're getting out of tuples, right? And you're going to pipe it into one function that's going to reduce it to a scalar or close to it. But yeah. Okay. That could be applied if that's what you're interested in. Great. So Gasper said what we did. So that's good. So <laughs> um, it's coming in, in essence, as a tuple. And so then you can apply whatever the operation is across um, the elements of the tuple and get a scalar out. Okay. So let's now mentally think about, oh, and, and what would you, who cares what you call it? Well, maybe you care what you call it. How would you denote it? If you're making this domain specific language, what is it gonna look like? How are you gonna write it? Okay, yeah. So what's interesting is, um, oh, this one. The natural result of this, not of that at all. Oh, I'm in delay. Okay, the result of this, right? So these, the idea of forking is you've got all these paths, but the result, what comes out of it is a tuple of the results of all the paths. And so, yeah, it's, it's just piping something in. Now, the other thing to mention too is um, you can compose these in different pieces and parts, right? So this, this ends up being something that you've composed that represents, I don't know, whatever that filter is given a name, right? And so these are just maybe the names of those things. And then the result of this whole thing, you can write in another line of F pipe G or whatever it is that you would like to write. So that uh, mentally it's easier to, of course, pull it all together. Okay, yep, so that's true. Um, okay, now how about this? This is 
mentally my favorite one. Nope, not the questions at all. We don't care about questions, actually. Because I'm asking questions now. <laughs> How about this one? You need like a socket, you need or another would you? In. <laughs> another what? Right. We call them sometimes we call them taps, right? right? So we need to put a tap somewhere that we can then feed that back. Now let's say we have one of those ends, and we could feed it into that. Um, how do we? So without this feedback loop, the re the return of this assembling this entire thing is a type that represents the computation, right? Let's ignore the feedback. And it's, it's in essence, this was the top last node, right? So it, it's something that is going to drive back and we're gonna get this thing. Now, with the feedback in there, does that cause us issue? Okay, syntactically it does. Well, this is the return, right? Yeah. You need a name tap. You stick the name in there. Okay. We were. Always yes. So I was trying hard to do functional programming things without saying the word functional or the word, any of the M words. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the talk has to be over now. We don't have a choice. Right, so it's taking the output of the control process um, and so what's interesting is Gasper made the observation is that this is basically a delay. If it's not a delay, we have problems. Like how could we ever calculate this, it right? Yeah. It would never terminate. So in essence, this is looking at this step in time, this place in time. What is it? And at another place in time, it's going to be the next thing. So it looks like a delay. Or it won't. <laughs> and then your filter is an oscillator, but that's okay. <laughs> Did you say the word future? Well, like with a promise? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I have no more questions either. So here, there are real downsides. And the, and the downsides are compile time. They're not like they used to be. So um, th this thing, in fact, for the kids at home, this used to be recursion, right? We would instantiate another type of n minus one until we finally got to the specialization of zero. Um, and then, you know, I don't even know who to say, but somebody got smart and <laughs> And then we have this, so that we actually expand it out. And, um, and that's wonderful. Um, what day is your talk? Tomorrow. Odin has a talk. Tomorrow the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow the day after tomorrow. Well, it's almost exactly on this stuff, but with a different take is tomorrow. Tomorrow's talk. Um, Odin has a talk where he'll talk more about the actual mechanics of the DSL, yes? <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more other 
other domains pulled into the same DSL. Okay. Right? So it's, it, well, it's, it has a DSL thing. Right? All the things, yes. By the way, this is basically a fusion metaprogramming Cartesian product with the grouping function being a point, right? That's correct. So if you did it that way, then will we had optimized it or I've optimized it? That's correct also. And use a different tuple if you care about some power. <laughs> <laughs> That's also right. <laughs> so the, the comments were uh, ranging from, which is why I was going to mention Odin's talk tomorrow. Odin has faster ways. Louise worked on this too. Faster ways of doing this type of thing. Um, if, if compile time ends up becoming one of these that you care about, use one of the libraries that help you do this. Um, the other is um, something else that you said, and now I don't even remember. Standard slow. Oh, standard tuple is slow. Um, so if if this is all internally inside of your own library. Um, you use something else, like one of the other tuples that exist in one of these other libraries. If you're not exposing it externally, you don't care. Um, if it's just internal workings and mechanics for you. Um, okay, so it's not C++. This is the biggest thing I hear from people when we introduce um, EDSLs inside of, inside of our project, is it doesn't look like C++, and that's the whole idea. It doesn't look like C++. It looks like whatever the domain-specific language is. Very good ones, like SML, look like the state machine thing, right? They look like the state machine that they're trying to mimic. And so, and they have no overhead. Um, another complaint, I have to learn yet one more library. And sometimes learning the one more library is well, well paid for. Um, and you should just do that. The, um, I know, I think Ben, you all use SML, right? And, um, very heavily. Oh, yeah, at least here too. Very heavily. And, and like, would you want to go back to hand coding? My understanding is what you do for a living requires things to execute very quickly. Huh, that's interesting. So you have a high level abstraction and it executes very quickly. That's neat. Yeah, so um, you can get both of those things. And you can get them in such a way where the system will verify itself. I think that's, again, as you compose things, you can put constraints on them, you can check to make sure that they're right things that you can't do otherwise. Um, declarative, correct by composition, speed and size are really not issues. All right, any other questions? Um, how much are you actually using this in, in practice? This actual library? Yeah, well, or something very similar to this with previous versions of Compact or whatever. Um, previous versions we have used inside of a motor controller, and it's stable. <laughs> Nobody's gotten hurt. No, it, it seems to work fine. Um, yeah, because, so we do like every good engineer should do, right? We, we go ahead and take a look at it. We look at what the assembly looks like. And it's like, okay, it looks pretty reasonable compared to some hand implemented thing. And once we feel comfortable with it, we stop actually looking. And until um, some type of test that we run doesn't perform the way that should perform on the system, then we, we just move on forward with techniques like these. And don't ever look back. <laughs> um, have you looked at uh, uh, Ableton's, uh, uh, um, uh, what's it called again? Um, they have from, from uh, Closure transducers. They've implemented in C++ that concept, which is uh, actually very similar to this, like a you know, push model with feedback okay. and they do it for audio stuff. But uh, that's actually really cool and very similar to this, not syntactically, but sort of as a paradigm. Okay, no, I have not looked at it. Um, so transducers, Ableton, that was a talk that uh, was given just recently, right? Embo talk that's not online yet. Okay. Um, and, uh, Wampit? Wampit, yeah. yeah. Um, I think he gave the same talk at CCPCon a long time ago, but uh, I think he writ that talk was like the library hadn't been written yet, and this talk was library exists and here's examples. Okay. Ableton Transducer Library is the comment to go look at. Atria, yeah. Atria? Thank you. Any other comments? You guys, you all did great. You stayed awake. It's hot in here. I got an impression that your company writes code for other customers. Yes. So you wrote something like this for other customers? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer this now. <laughs> 
we, we, uh, we, we solve a variety of different problems for other customers. And so depending upon what it is that we're working on, sometimes it's a whole turnkey project, like a control system for a pump. And then we get to do anything we want, right? So we're, we're dealing with everything from the Verilog on the FPGA to the MCU to the whole thing. So we write it in any way we want to, and we deliver them the source code. Um, sometimes we integrate into a group, and typically if they're already engaging us, then they're, they already know that we're interested in modern techniques. And so we're trying to help the team move along, or we integrate into a team that already is using modern techniques. Um, because they are okay with the yeah. techniques like that. Yeah. They are even okay with them. <laughs> yeah. So the deal is, the, the key is, I think, one way to characterize a large amount of what we do is we, we write a lot of libraries. And so we write libraries in such a way where the interface is super elegant and easy to use and all of the ugliness is behind the scene and you know, normal people on a normal day would never see it, ever. Would you describe the interface if you have to make up a new piece? <laughs> 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 so I take it you guys have very good documentation for these things? Uh, I think we produce actually really good documentation. Yes. <laughs> My question is, so the most obvious domain-specific language I can imagine uh, and is useful for me is something that does some kind of algebra or some kind of algebra computation, like a linear algebra or you know, operations with vectors, with big objects that I don't want to make explicit at some point. And what happens is that I start doing that DSL, implementing some myself, trying to use uh, Web Master Proto at some point. Oh, yeah. And what I see is that actually, besides the domain specific language I want, I usually want to keep the C itself. So I end up kind of extending in Phoenix, for example. And this is where I fail. It, it becomes a nightmare and problem because I don't know how to hack Phoenix. But do you have a recommendation for people that want to extend the C DSL into something larger? Or we should start very small and keep it very small? Uh, no, I don't think so. So uh, let's talk afterwards. Did you say Phoenix? Yes. Yeah, we'll definitely talk afterwards. It's rather a slow, not a question, but uh, so first of all, I really love this stuff and I really like template meta programming. And personally, I use Blue Spirit in particular a lot, but. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, so when you implement, say, a parser in Blue Spirit, uh, once you did that, you can't really analyze it statically anymore. You can't prove you did it like. Uh, you can do less recursion correctly, but your parser terminates, stuff like this. And this is something that external tools can help with. And even if I were to implement the script myself, I probably will have like really hard time uh, implementing all those algorithms in like metaprogramming style. So this is a con of uh, DSLs, in case you want to do some kind of static analysis for all this. Hmm. Okay. So um, the, the verification of DSLs is difficult. Is that? More or less, yeah. And by DSLs. And I, the word verification and <laughs> Lisa. Uh, yes, Lisa. I wasn't going to say anything about verification. Oh, okay. There's something about matrices that just came up. Yeah. Which, if you have used matrices, they are one of your older EDSLs. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, they, they were invented as a, as a domain specific language for systems of equations. Yeah, matrices are basically EDSLs. Uh, how are the, the error messages when you, when you have a type mismatch yeah. when using the, the uh, pipe? So, uh, so the question is, how about error messages? So error messages are better today than they have been in the past. <laughs> um, and you know, really, it's using, using lots of static asserts, asserting that what you want to be true is actually true. Um, there are all these hands now suddenly in the back <laughs> <laughs> of how that breaks, but. I, as long as your expressions aren't too long, this is actually going to have really nice mm -hmm. error messages. And if your expressions are long, you can always break them into shorter ones if, if something is not working. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the full undefined class compiler printf hack, which is basically just template type name t struct undefined without a body, 
is that you just instantiate it and the compiler will handily tell you what the hell the type is that you forgot to provide a special yeah. condition for. Yeah, which, which um, we have our little, every, every company has a library of stuff, right? Our little, <laughs> our little library of stuff has, of course, those in it too, right? Because you use them all the time. But, so I think um, the idea of composition is great because you can compose small things, figure it out, right? That what's not working out well for you. The, the other part of that though is if you're getting horrible error messages, that, that's like poor quality of implementation for the library these days. Libraries these days in, in this year, 2018, should give you good error messages. There's no reason for them not to. And, and so if you've got just like spew coming out, um, instead of beating on the compiler vendors, you should beat on your library producer. And that, so, and that's a really good point. When you're implementing a DSL, all the assumptions are already there, right? It's a domain specific language. You have an assumption about this thing that you just created. Just write it. Create it in a static assert, write it out. Create all of the helpers that you need, make new types if you have to. You're gonna kill yourself if you don't. I personally don't mind extra compile time if I get a good error message. And static assert is the way to get exactly the error message you want. Well, sometimes. I mean, I wish I actually, I wish, well, a lot, I wish a lot of things. Static assert has one major flaw. I mean, hint has others, but uh, <laughs> that's, you, you, you can't compute the text. Right? Yeah. And no, you can't. It has to be literal. Yeah, and sometimes the assumption that you need is actually very deep down the template instantiation stack. Mm -hmm. So that, That's my biggest complaint, actually, about yeah, it, is you can't so, so compute the It's not text for dependency. No, but it's way better than anything else. But it seems like we should be able to standardize something. <laughs> <laughs> Odin and then Louis. Yeah. The, the, the counter question is, uh, you know, how bad is the error message that you don't get, right? Because like, if, if you made some flaw in that program, when you wrote it in a DSL, you're going to get a lot more static checking, a lot more errors than if you read it by hand. And if you read it by hand, it's going to be an error that you find with a debugger or that you never find, right? Yeah, this is actually a really good point that Odin's making. Um, and I probably made it too subtly earlier, is that the, when, I, when I'm talking about composing and be able to check things, what I'm talking about is that you're able to make sure that what you put together actually is correct with all the assumptions you expected. Whereas if you write this without DSL, you're not doing that, right? If you, if you created whatever it is for your filter and you don't write all of those assumptions in, um, into asserts, then, I don't know, who knows what it is that it didn't find or didn't check. You have to, you have to discover them in the debugger. Well, hopefully you discover them in the debugger. Well, if you can actually debug, right? Like, and you run know, a debugger. You have hardware uh, in the office often, right? Like, you know, if your thing runs in a box in Siberia and you don't, you, you can't, like, build test equipment in your office that actually re represents what's happening in that box in Siberia, then you actually have to get on a plane and go to Siberia to debug that, right? I mean, I had a bug that only happened on a model of car that was only produced in China. Have fun, right? And the bug could have been found with static analysis with this kind of asserting stuff, right? Like, you can write a lot of templates in like the month it took me to find the bug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with the writing lots of templates in that amount of time, we're out of time. Thank you all.